That was a major turning point in all of human history. That's the point where per capita consumption of petroleum reached its peak before it started its inevitable decline. And there isn't any way I can see that we can reverse that trend, that downward trend, given the world population growth and given the fact that we're right close to the peak of world production. Well, Dr. Hubbard addressed a committee of the Congress. He told them that the exponential phase of the industrial growth, which has dominated human activities during the last couple of centuries, is now drawing to a close. Yet during the last two centuries of unbroken industrial growth, we have evolved what amounts to an exponential growth culture. I would say it's more than a culture, it's our national religion, because we worship growth. Pick up any newspaper, you'll see headlines such as this, state forecast robust growth. Have you ever heard of a physician diagnosing a cancer in the patient and telling the patient you have a robust cancer? We had Americans being killed in the Gulf War. What's this person worried about? He doesn't care about people. He doesn't care about people being killed. All he's worried about is, oh, the Gulf situation may hurt Colorado's growth. Now this incredible addiction is not limited to the United States. The Wall Street Journal tells us that the Japanese are so accustomed to growth that economists in Tokyo usually speak of a recession as any time the growth rate dips below 3% per year. So what do we do? In the words of Winston Churchill, sometimes we have to do what is required. We must educate all of our people to an understanding of the arithmetic and the consequences of growth, especially in terms of populations and in terms of the Earth's finite resources. We must educate people to recognize the fact that growth of populations and growth of rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. Now, the world is full of people who are yakking about sustainability. Now, some of them are doing serious good things, like trying to reduce energy consumption and things like this. Some of them are just trying to attack the word, attack the word sustainability onto whatever they're doing, whether it's sustainable or not. We've got to understand the first law of sustainability, and it follows directly from what I've just been talking about. The first law of sustainability is this, population growth and or growth in the rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. Now this follows from the arithmetic of steady growth that we spent time developing. So this isn't an opinion. Opinions are debatable. This is fact. There's no, nothing here to debate. You cannot sustain population growth. You cannot sustain growth in the rates of consumption of resources. And so it's intellectually dishonest to talk about sustainability without stressing the obvious fact that stopping population growth is a necessary condition for sustainability. Now, it's not sufficient. Stopping population growth in itself is not sufficient, but there's no way you can have sustainability if you don't stop population growth. We need to educate people to see the need to examine carefully the allegations of the technological optimists who assure us that science and technology will always be able to solve all of our problems of population growth, food, energy, and resources. Now, chief among these optimists was the late Dr. Julian Simon, formerly professor of economics and business administration at the University of Illinois, and later at the University of Maryland. With regard to copper, Simon has written that we will never run out of copper because copper can be made from other metals. Well, the letters to the editor jumped all over him, told him about chemistry. He just brushed it off. He said, don't worry. If it's ever important, we'll figure out how to make copper out of other metals. Simon had a book that was published by the Princeton University Press. And in that book, he's writing about oil from many sources, including biomass. And he says, clearly, there's no meaningful limit to this source except for the sun's energy. He goes on to note, but even if our sun were not so vast as it is, there may well be other suns elsewhere. <laughs> Simon's right. <laughs> there are other suns elsewhere. But now the question is, would you base public policy on the belief 
that if we ever need another sun, we'll figure out how to go get it and haul it back into the solar system. Now don't laugh. For decades before his death, this man was a trusted policy advisor at the very highest levels in Washington, D.C. Here's a quotation from one of his strong supporters. There was a UN report that talked about the possibility of resource collapse because of population growth. And when asked about the report, HUD Secretary Jack Kemp said, nonsense, people are not a drain on the resources of the planet. Malcolm Forbes, Jr., editor-in-chief of Forbes magazine, tells us in an editorial that CNN recently ran a silly series purporting to show that the world's in mortal danger because there are too many of us. In the poorer countries, the many mouths mean poverty, and richer countries are wrecking the Earth's atmosphere with pollution. It's all nonsense. Bill Moyers interviewed Isaac Asimov. He asked Asimov, what happens to the idea of the dignity of the human species if this population growth continues? And Asimov says it'll be completely destroyed. I like to use what I call my bathroom metaphor. If two people live in an apartment and the two bathrooms and both have freedom of the bathroom, you can go to the bathroom anytime you want, stay as long as you want for whatever you need, and everyone believes in freedom of the bathroom, it should be right there in the Constitution. But if you have 20 people in the apartment and two bathrooms, then no matter how much every person believes in freedom of the bathroom, there's no such thing. You have to set up times for each person. You have to bang on the door. Aren't you through yet? And so on. And Asimov concluded with what I think is one of the most profound observations I've seen in years. Asimov says in the same way, democracy cannot survive over population. Human dignity cannot survive over population. Convenience and decency cannot survive over population. As you put more and more people into the world, the value of life not only declines, it disappears. It doesn't matter if someone dies. The more people there are, the less one individual matters. Now let me give you two examples of this destruction of democracy by population growth. I joined the faculty here in 1950. At that time, the population of Boulder was about 20,000. There were nine members of the city council. Today, it's approaching 100,000. There are nine members of the city council. So in a little over 50 years, the number of people per member of the city council has increased by a factor of five. Democracy in Boulder has declined to 20% of what it was 50 years ago. And the second example has to do with the year 2000 national census. This showed that in the decade of the 90s, the U.S. population increased by about 13 percent. Now this means every House seat in the House of Representatives now has 13 percent more constituents on the average than they did 10 years ago. And in the last one hour, the world population has increased by about 10,000 people, and the population of the United States in this one hour has increased by about 280 people. And we have to ask, why don't more U.S. environmentalists and environmental organizations speak out about the problem of population growth here in the United States? The simple arithmetic makes it absolutely clear that long-term preservation of the environment in the U.S is impossible in the face of continued U.S. population growth. But you hear all sorts of political leaders say, oh, we can have our growth, we'll call it smart growth, and smart growth will save the environment. Well, we need to know about smart growth. Smart growth destroys the environment. Dumb growth destroys the environment. Now, smart growth just destroys the environment with good taste. So it's a little like buying a ticket on the Titanic. If you're smart, you go first class. If you're dumb, you go steerage, but the result's the same. So central to the things that we must do is to recognize that population growth is the immediate cause of all of our resource and environmental crises. And of all the crises, I think this one, global warming, looms larger and more threatening.